I believe we're beginning now. So uh, I'm quite sure that people will still be coming in, in the next moment or two. So um, nonetheless, I will begin because it gives me great pleasure to speak about and then with uh, our, our authors today. So I'd like to give uh, a warm welcome uh, to all of you who are attending. And I'm going to introduce uh, myself as well as the authors um, in just a minute. So uh, I'm Jonathan Eburn. I am the series editor of the Refiguring Modernism book series at the Penn State University Press. I teach literature at Penn State University. And so it, I don't have very far to go uh, either for this talk or for the editing process. Um, I just head down to the office. Before getting started, I'd like to thank uh, Kate Frick, who put this event together. And then also, uh, and perhaps especially Ellie Goodman, who's the executive editor of the Penn State Press and who works tirelessly, and I really mean that tirelessly, with um, all of us, the authors, as well as everybody involved in the production of these books. Speaking of the books, which we're going to be doing at great length, I want to just mention that anybody attending today um, can rec will receive a follow-up email with links to the books uh, today, as well as a special discount code for 40% off those titles. These are very beautiful books. And um, anyway, I have my copies already on hand. So uh, I mentioned that at the end as well. You probably saw the opening screen if you were here. Uh, finally, if you'd like to find out more about these kind of virtual events that happen uh, at Penn State Press uh, on a monthly basis, as well as, of course, the wonderful books that Penn State Press prints, in not only books in modernism, but actually books in medieval studies, um, Latin American studies, magic, uh, the really terrific stuff, please visit www.psupress.org and follow the press on Twitter and Facebook. So we have uh, a, a robust series of, of speakers today um, based on the three books that we're featuring as part of this event. Um, and we're gonna, they're going to speak in order. So I'm just going to say their names first, and I'll introduce them um, individually as, as we proceed. Um, so first, we have Mark Antliff, who is the author of Sculptors Against the State, Anarchism and the Anglo-European Avant-Garde. We're also joined by Elliot H. King and Abigail Sussex, editors of Radical Dreams, Surrealism, Counterculture, Resistance. And we're also joined by Katie L. Price and Michael R. Taylor, edit editors of Pataphysics Unrolled. I'm going to ask each author, each set of authors, to tell us a little bit about their book, and then we'll open it up for discussion, um, followed by questions. We'll be taking your questions as well as questions from the different authors. I think it'd be a very exciting conversation. Um, you can submit a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if your question is for a specific author, please note that uh, in your comment, and we'll do our best to get to as many of the questions as we can. So I'd like to suggest we begin um, alphabetically with Mark Antliff, who is Mary Grace Wilson Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Duke University. Um, he's the author of, of many books, including Inventing Bergson, uh, Cultural po Politics and the Parisian Avant-Garde, and uh, a book that I admire very much, uh, and also another book I admire very much, which is Avant-Garde Fascism, The Mobilization of Myth, Art, and Culture in France, 1909 to 1939. And so he'll be speaking once again about his new book, Sculpture, Sculptures Against the State, Anarchism, and the Anglo-European Avant-Garde. Mark? You're, you're muted. Mark, you're still muted. Uh, the bottom left corner should be the, the unmute button. Sorry, there we are. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so in, in working on this book, it's, it's, it relates to issues that, that I've been thinking about for many, many years. And the fundamental um, sort of core issue that I discovered or paradigm that I was working with is the notion of the state, not necessarily as a set of institutions, but as a state of mind. And this is a fundamental sort of paradigm within the anarchist movement that goes right back to the origins of the movement in the 19th century, where they thought about the state in terms of the, the kinds of psychological dispositions that it encouraged and the kind of interpersonal relationships that it fostered. 
So those two things together. And what I sought to do in this particular book is to look at a series of case studies focusing on the work of Jacob Epstein, Henri Godier Breschka, and Umberto Boccioni to consider major sculpt sculptures by these artists um, and the group of people who were affiliated with them uh, to discuss the way in which you could think of the very medium of sculpture as implicated or integral to this notion of psychological transformation, not only through the act of making it, but also through uh, a kind of way of theorizing the notion of how the work would be received and how it could be discussed. So uh, it was a, a, a notion of, of states of mind as integral to the artistic process of making art, um, to the relationship of artists to each other, and finally to the creation or fostering of a new uh, audience, a radicalization of that audience through the work of art. And uh, it combined the study of ideology and ideologues. So I was looking at uh, major uh, theorists, including Georges Sorel, who was the subject of my previous book, Avant-Garde Fascism, but also uh, well-known literary uh, uh, people like Ezra Pound, Oscar Wilde, um, seeing the way in which their thought was um, uh, permeated with anarchist precepts, and then looking at ideologues like Dora Marsden, for instance, who's very well known to those who study English literature, aside from Sorrell, also political activists and anti-militarists who were anarchists like Gustave Hervé in, in the, the case of, of French culture. And the way in which their ideas um, were adopted uh, and, and reformulated in a creative way by these artists, both in terms of their uh, rhetorical language, but also in terms of the, the process of art making. So the book was very much about seeing a work of art, not as an ossified thing, but as part of a process and part of a formation of community. Um, so those are the fundamental messages that I brought to the subject. And this is all within the frame of the period before the, the uh, First World War. Um, I could say more, I guess. Um, the major monuments that I discuss uh, were the um, tomb of Oscar Wilde in Père Lachaise Cemetery, which was actually censored by the state as indecent uh, when it was unveiled in 1912 and then covered over again. Uh, Umberto Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space, which people can see casts of in the Tate and also in the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum and other institutions. And the way in which Boccioni saw that work and a whole series of sculptures of muscular nudes is politicized. And then with Gaudier Breschka, I really looked at the, the full um, spectrum of his production. Um, from his uh, early, his sort of handheld sculptures that he created for individuals within his coterie, um, but most importantly, his hieratic head of Ezra Pound, uh, which I read through the lens of, uh, of egoism, um, the uh, philosophical anarchism of Max Stirner, and in turn, the adoption of that political uh, framework by Dora Marsden and Ezra Pound. So one has this sort of um, three artists, three very different cultural backgrounds, all of them bringing together uh, a notion of politics within the framework of a cosmopolitan form of avant-gardism in politics. So that's the other thing I should mention about the book. It conceives of anarchism as a, uh, a movement that was transnational. And that makes sense given the fact that anarchism is against the state. But um, I, I tried to chart the networks that were formed between various anarchist movements in France, in Milan, um, Paris, Milan, and London, and New York, um, to show the extent to which this moment of modernity was really about exchange on a global scale. So, um, 
that was the book's framework. And uh, then the meta narrative in it was the subject of violence and the role of violence in sculpture and the creative conception of sculpture by these artists. And in an the anarchist movement, the eventual repudiation of violence as a method. And this related to a very important anarchist paradigm called prefiguration. So uh, prefiguration stood for the notion of a congruence of means and ends. How do you make a revolution or how do you make an insurrection and the method by which you carry that forth and whether it's conducive with the ends that you see. This is a very important issue that came to transform the anarchist movement especially with regard to uh, whether one should endorse forms of violence or not. So that's a, a meta narrative that takes me into the 1940s at the end of the book where I discuss the paradigm shift in the anarchist movement in terms of tactics as related to this notion of states of mind. Um, so that's, that's basically it. That's terrific, Mark. Thank you for that uh, account, which I don't know, I think, I think you'll all agree with me that that's really educational, <laughs> um, as well as a beautiful summary of the book, but I mean, a, a kind of pocket history in, in its own right. Um, so now I'm going to pass uh, the speaking stick, as it were, to, um, to the co-editors uh, and authors of uh, Radical Dreams, Surrealism, Counterculture and Resistance. So in Elliot H. King, is Associate Professor of Art History at Washington and Lee University, and is the author of Salvador Dali, The Late Work, and Dali, Surrealism, and Cinema. Just a, I mean, a really wonderful scholar of, of Dali's work. And he's the founding board member of the International Society for the Study of Surrealism, uh, as is uh, Abigail Susick, uh, who is Associate Professor of Art History at Willamette, uh, sorry, at Willamette University, my pronunciation goodness and the author of uh, uh the very recent surrealist sabotage and the war on work another wonderful uh book um however it's not in the series so we can't talk about it she also co-edited the volume surrealism and film after 1945 absolutely modern mysteries and again as a board member a founding board member of the international society for the study of surrealism so i invite you both to talk a little bit about um the collection Thank you. We have some images to share. So Elliot is going to share his screen. And um, thanks so much for organizing this, everybody, and for Kate and Jonathan for hosting, and also Ellie Goodman, our editor, and um, everybody on staff. Um, Elliot, should we just start by saying a couple of things about how the book got got going? Right. With, with, with two people, we'll be volleying a little bit. So I think that that sounds good. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll just say that um, basically in the field of surrealism studies for a long time that there was a view that surrealism sort of petered out or ended in maybe the 40s or 50s or certainly with the death of Andre Breton in 1966. But in recent decades, the field collectively has said, well, this is just not true. Uh, surrealism remains active um, on an international scale um, after 66 into the 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. There are still current contemporary surrealist groups today. And so if that's the case, then, you know, what is this sort of cache of material that we could discover? that had been previously neglected in academic or museum type studies. And so this, this opened up a question for us of a kind of living surrealism, and in particular, a living surrealism that was connected to active protest histories. We knew that surrealism uh, or surrealists were involved in May 68 in the protests in France, but we also felt that there were many other instances of protest or oppositional culture to authoritarianism um, and also pop culture uh, diversion subcultures that could be explored. So that that's my way of talking about the initial impetus for the book. And uh, and I think to that, I would just add that when we first began thinking about this project, it was part of a College Art Association panel. and. Uh, one of the things that we were able to, to do was involve uh, Penelope Rosemont with that as one of the co-founders of the Chicago Surrealist Group, uh, who has a wonderful essay in this book as well. 
And I think that, that really opened the door for us rethinking about these unnecessary divides between scholarship and active living surrealism. So part of our agenda too with the book is to bring some of those voices in to not only think about surrealism's political relevance today, but hear that from uh, actual surrealists instead of purely the academics who might study it from afar, um, like myself. So, um, so that's been another aspect I think is re really quite special about this volume and unusual in terms of other books on surrealism, even of this later period. Do you want to say a little bit about our intro and our ideas, or shall we just hop right into essays, uh, Abigail? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll just say very briefly that we were interested in, in, in our introduction, we lay out a kind of methodology that might be more encompassing or generous, inclusive in not only uh, proper surrealisms, and maybe I should say improper surrealisms, but in things that are surrealist per se, um, but also alliances with non-surrealist groups, individuals, movements. And so there's definitely a comparative interdisciplinary uh, thrust to the book. And we struggle in the introduction, um, I think in a somewhat productively unresolved way, to um, suggest that there might be new avenues for considering the movement as a whole in terms of affinity groups. And I use that in the political sense, um, specifically in, in an anarchist modality. Um, so the intro is a great way to get a sense of what the overall project is. And with that idea of modalities, we began, as I say, the actual project at a conference in Chicago where in fact the uh, it was at the Hilton Hotel where demonstrations had ensued in 1968 that the surrealists were in fact a part of so we don't necessarily think about them as active uh, during that period but they certainly were we have as Abigail said those with affinities with surrealism that may not necessarily identify themselves as surrealists like uh, Janae Burroughs, uh, Terry Southern, uh, John Sack, uh, ar artists and writers who were certainly Countercultural, certainly avant-garde, had a relevance to surrealism, but we're really expanding that purview to think about how surrealism might have influenced and how some of those affinities might be shared, including uh, with uh, the activist, writer, poet, Ted Jones, uh, to whom the book is actually uh, dedicated and who features prominently in the Tate's current Surrealism Beyond Borders exhibition. The first essay, so I think we're just gonna go very quickly to talk about each essay in short. Um, our, our first introductory essay is by Michael Lilly, uh, Surrealism and Revolutionary Romanticism in May of 68. Um, Michael's an Emeritus Research Director in Social Science at the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique and also an active member of contemporary international surrealist groups. So we were feeling very fortunate to have his voice as one who's really rethought the political position of surrealism over the last uh, four decades. His research and uh, paper focuses on French protests of May 68, but takes those anti-rationalist, anti-capitalist critiques of commodification very much into the present to rethink surrealism's romanticism and its enduring relevance then in 68, but today as well, which again brings our book partially into history, but partially up to now. Right, and so then we move into, we actually have a few different sections in the book. Um, there are the Surrealist Solidarity is section one. We have three essays, another section called Against the Liquidators, one called The Right to Insubordination, and the final section is called Passional Attractions. All of these phrases are sort of from different periods of, of Surrealism's lifespan over the last 100 years. And the first section is called Surrealist Solidarity. The initial uh, chapter in that section is by Sandra Zalman. Um, in that section, this, this notion of surreal solidarity for us was based on Ron Sikorsky, who is a scholar of surrealism and, and anarchism, his notion of radical inclusivity, and also the way in which the Chicago surrealists starting in the 1960s focused on um, kind of union-based ideas of solidarities across different factional lines in order to create organizational efforts, um, various forms of resistance that could be coordinated uh, across groups or individuals. And so this notion of solidarity within surrealism and uh, beyond it was really key to one of our ideas. 
about what we wanted to do for this book. Um, so Sandra's chapter, as you can maybe see from this wonderful image and caption, focuses on um, the 1968 protests led by a couple of different groups, uh, a lot of student groups in particular, against the Dada Surrealism and their Heritage Exhibition at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which was created by William Rubin. And so there's a fascinating history there of that the particular protest events. And you can see the little sign that the gentleman is holding that says Dada is dead, right? So the idea here is how to get surrealism um, as a radical avant-garde out of the institution. The second essay in the Surrealist Solidarity section is by Gregory uh, Perrault. Um, Greg uh, writes a really wonderful chapter on uh, Ted Jones. Uh, Greg places Ted Jones, as he says, with that other Jones, who is the jazz musician Leroy Jones, to discuss Ted Jones's dedication to jazz, surrealism, and Black power, forming what might be called an aesthetics of direct action. Uh, highlighting Jones's Black Manifesto in jazz poetry and prose from 1969, and his participation in the Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers in July of 69, Puro argues that for Jones, surrealism was a means but never an end to liberation. And we have some really wonderful illustrations and some descriptions of, of Jones' activities really bringing uh, a, a really fresh voice and perspective to surrealism's politics and ideas of protest. So we're short on time, Elliot, so we're going to go very quickly through the rest of our chapters. Um, the final section, uh, final chapter in Surrealist Solidarity is by the Chicago Surrealist Penelope Rosemont. And it's a, a wonderful kind of retrospective view of the movement's activities focusing on the 60s and 70s, in particular their uh, 1976 Marvelous Freedom exhibition um, that was configured in connection with um, their longstanding history of protest. Um, and activism and anti-war, uh, civil rights, um, and other movements in this period. Following, we have Claire Howard's uh, essay on uh, Charles Fourier, Feminism, Free Love, and the Le Carre Absolu exhibition in 1965. Uh, Claire places the Le Carre Absolu show in the context of Fourier's writings on gender equality and sexual liberation. Uh, with some rare photographs in color of that 1965 show. Um, all of the essays in the collection are really great, in my own opinion, of course, but I will say that uh, I have actually even started using this one in my undergraduate classes. I think it brings a really fresh and interesting perspective for uh, those interested in surrealism and gender. So our, our next session, a section, sorry, next chapter in the second section, Against the Liquidators, is by Gavin Parkinson, who's a leading scholar in the field. Um, and he takes a moment to explore the way in which Robert Rauschenberg's reception by the French Surrealist group in the late 50s and 60s was connected to uh, the Algerian War and the group's uh, active protest to France's involvement in that war and the war crimes that France committed. Um, and so the, the surrealist reception of Rauschenberg very positively um, was about kind of configuring him as an anti-modernist and uh, a little bit later an anti-pop or anti-commercial artist. Alice Mann is a well-known uh, scholar of surrealism based at Cambridge. Uh, she has uh, contributed an essay on Roberta Mata's images br of brutality during the Algerian war and also uh, brings some, up some new considerations on this painting Burn Baby Burn, which she links uh, compellingly to the Watts riots in Los Angeles. And, uh, and again, considering surrealism's vitality and direct action after the Second World War. I'll speak very briefly to the chapter on SI situationism by uh, Mikhail Bolt Remison, but um, you should definitely read at least um, the opening paragraphs of this chapter um, in which he talks about Guy Debord uh, going to this event discussing whether or not surrealism is dead or alive, Debord taking out a bottle of whiskey and a tape recorder and hitting play um, on the lecture which declared surrealism isn't dead, it's still alive, but it is currently irrelevant. Nevertheless, Rasmussen talks about the way in which the situationists continue to reference surrealism over and over throughout their different manifestations. Next, we have a familiar name, Jonathan Eburn. Uh, Jonathan's a professor of comparative literature, English and French and Francophone studies at the Pennsylvania State University. 
Jonathan's chapter considers the legacy, appropriation, and relevance of surrealism to Afro-surrealism, a term coined in 1988 by the poet Amiri Baraka. Afro-surrealism gestures towards surrealism while remaining independent from it, denoting a sense of change and transition and anticipating Paul Gilroy's portrayal of the Black Atlantic as a, quote, countercultural of modernity. Our next chapter is by Ron Sikulski, who was, is also an active member of American Canadian surrealist groups. And this chapter is really exciting because he's talking about eco activism in connection to uh, surrealist and anarchist groups. There's a group in particular called Earth First. Um, and so Chicago surrealist ideas such as shutting down zoos, which are prisons for animals, um, and of course, all kinds of reclamation of land for indigenous uses and um, anti-capitalist uses. So this is a, a, a very innovative chapter that I hope people will read. Uh, Ryan Stanfest is a Detroit-based multimedia artist and editor and publisher of Rotland Press which specializes in satirical publications of a culturally relevant nature. And Dooley, he is looking at US popular culture in the 1960s as a stage for black humor, considering uh, Breton's anthology of black humor, but also uh, its legacies in the writings of Perry Southern, Michael O'Donoghue, and artworks by the likes of Andy Warhol. So our next chapter is by David Hopkins, a scholar based in the UK, um, which is very much about the British counterculture, psychedelia, rock music, um, also in connection with an Australian, initially Australian based publication and uh, later UK based called Oz. Um, and the uh, criminalization at some point of this journal in relation to obscenity charges. Um, and as you can see, um, artists associated with this journal and with this British counterculture uh, use a lot of surrealist references such as Max Ernst here um, in the establishment of their own uh, subcultures. And the last contribution is by Mary Arla Skov on Surrealism and Punk. Uh, she is a Danish art historian work, uh, working in Berlin and considers uh, punk's legacies and connections, uh, synergies with surrealism. Usually punk is uh, perhaps more aligned with Dada, but Skov reframes the subversive appropriation, remixing and collage practices of uh, the Coom Transmission Collective, uh, Genesis Porridge, Cozy Fanny Tutti, and others associated with the uh, punk musical group as a negation of the dialectic between popular and counterculture. And so like all of the contributions in their own ways, uh, Marie's reminds us that surrealism was not and is not an historical dead end, but still a, liver, a living current of cultural and political action. Thank you so much, um, Elliot and Abigail. And as pun, the pun allows us to roll right along to, um, sorry, obligatory. Uh, to Pataphysics Unrolled. And so I'd like to uh, welcome and, in, and introduce Katie L. Price, who is Associate Director at the, the Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility and a co-director of the Philadelphia Avant-Garde Studies Consortium. She's also interviews editor at the journal Jacket 2 and the author of the chapbook BRCA, Birth of a Patient. And uh, with her today is Michael R. Taylor, who is the Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Art and Education at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, he's the author of numerous books, including uh, Marcel Duchamp, Etant Donné, uh, Archal Gorky, A Retrospective, and Thomas Chimes, Adventures in Pataphysics. So now we can hear about our third book today, Pataphysics Unrolled. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, I apologize in advance that I'm a little bit under the weather, so I hope you'll forgive me if I take more breaks than usual. Um, I'm gonna talk for the majority and then bunt it over to Michael. <laughs> Is that right, Michael? Um, so if you'll indulge me, I'd actually just like to read a little bit um, from, from the introduction actually um, of the book. And very quickly before I do that, I'll say that um, this book really came about because for me at least, pataphysics was one of those topics that was everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> Everyone seemed to be talking about it, but no one could kind of say where they heard about it for the first time or um, that sort of thing. So this book in some way was a way to kind of identify that, that phenomenon. So uh, in 1960, an absinthe colored cover of the Evergreen Review asked the question, what is pataphysics? Now, more than 60 years later, a more appropriate question might be why 
Why has pataphysics, a science invented in the 1880s by Alfred Jarry and his schoolmates to mock their incompetent teacher, how, why has this persisted as a mode of joko serious artistic production into the 21st century? Pataphysics has maintained a near constant presence through modernism, postmodernism, and into contemporary experimental practices, capturing the imagination of people as diverse as Duchamp, the Baroness Elsa von Freitag, Beckett, Joyce, Cage, Man Ray, The Beatles, Juan Moreau, Jean Genet, Baudrillard, Christian Book, Amy Catanzana, William Kentridge, the list could go on and on. Um, but the word pataphysics was actually only acknowledged by the Oxford English Dictionary in June of 2005. <laughs> so um, despite the term kind of only recently being acknowledged, it's really been a persistent mode of intellectual poetic, conceptual, and artistic experimentation for over a century. Um, and this book is one attempt uh, to, ask, to ask why. Um, so the introduction then kind of goes just a little bit into Jari's origins. Um, Alistair Brochi has a really comprehensive biography that I highly recommend for folks who want to do a deep dive. But really quickly, he lived a pataphysical life. It was short. He died of tuberculosis, aggravated by alcoholism at 34, um, but just was explosively creative during that time. And he really cultivated a life of profound ridiculousness with the utmost seriousness. He took it very seriously, right? Um, he kept a pet owl. He lived on the second and a half floor of a Paris apartment um, that scraped his head. He was about my height, 5'2". Um, he wore bicyclist clothing for almost all occasions, pronounced mute ease in everyday conversation, called his bicycle that which rolls and the wind that which blows, um, and used to drink absinthe in quantities so vast to um, induce hallucinations purposefully. <laughs> um, and the off-sided culmination to his life of absurdity was his deathbed request for a toothpick, because you really need that uh, in your last moments. So he, I, you know, it's very cliche to say, but I think for Jari, life was his art and art was his life. And he really tried to make the quotidian preposterous and the preposterous quotidian. <laughs> so kind of doing both um, at the same time. Um, and Mark, you, maybe we can get into this in the Q&A a little bit, um, but Jari was really in, uh, influenced by going to Bergson's lectures um, from 1881 to 1891. And he, he loved Bergson, but he disagreed with him about this concept of epiphenomenalism, which is the idea that consciousness itself could be an accidental byproduct um, of the brain, <laughs> right? So the brain is the main function and consciousness just kind of happens to happen. Um, and he really became obsessed with this idea, I think, um, of epiphenomenalism. And this idea that if consciousness itself is accidental, then perhaps we can cultivate a ludic reality, right? It's a way of saying that we can actually choose our own reality in a way. Um, so before he gets there, though, I think we have to remember that pataphysics as a concept came from his schoolboy days. Um, and again, pataphysics referencing um, a distinction between pataphysics as such from the physics kind of nonsensically taught to them by a notoriously incompetent and buffoonish teacher, Felix Frederic, uh, Frederic Hebert, um, who became the main character in a series of comical poems and stories and plays written and performed by the boys, which I just love, like, you know, just mocking teachers <laughs> from the very beginning, mocking authority, um, uh, kind of standard modes of knowledge production. And um, that character kind of became the Ubu of the Ubu plays, which Jari is most famous for. Um, and one of the things that this book argues, I think implicitly, if not explicitly, is that oftentimes Jari's work is thought of in terms of Ubu and maybe pataphysics, and they're seen as compliments. But I actually think it's much more accurate to call them rivals. Um, Jari was often characterized as if he was Ubu and was kind of made to play this part in the salons of Paris. But pataphysics was really um, his theoretical and 
serious, although Joko serious, um, contribution to philosophy. And his neo-scientific novel, Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faustro Pataphysician, um, really, I believe, has had the most lasting and wide-ranging impact on artistic practices um, of the last century. So while Jari never got to hear Apollinaire call uh, Faustrel the most important publication of 1911, I think he'd be happy to see if he were alive today that more and more scholars are starting to recognize that Faustrel was Jari's true magnum opus um, and was by far his more his most complex um, his complex complex work. Um, and I think it's important to think about the elevation of pataphysics kind of in its origins as this adolescent joke to a term um, worth, um, worth a treatise. That was Zari's original plan was to write a treatise on pataphysics, um, but really to a term of philosophical import worthy of a lifelong and indeed centuries long <laughs> commitment um, was really due to this idea, excuse me, of its ability to allow us to cultivate um, a ludic reality. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing a great job, Katie. <laughs> Thanks. I've been sick, <laughs> sick all week and I was hoping to kick it by today. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, this book really turns to how pataphysics has unrolled from its origins and Jari's text into the contemporary moment. And we look at it um, through a kind of explication of a famous line from Faustrel. And behold, the wallpaper of Faustrel's body was unrolled by the saliva and teeth of the water. Like a musical score, all art and all science were written in the curves of the limbs of the ultra sexagenarian of Phoebe, and their progression to an infinite degree was prophesied therein. And by describing the wallpaper of Faustrel's body, which I read as the text of Faustrel itself, as unrolled by the saliva and teeth of the water, I think Jari alludes to textual rumination, a chewing on of the text that releases its full flavor and provides sustenance to the reader. So with a hyperbolic mock religious tone, the lines both prophesize, prophesize and invoke the continuation of pataphysical en enterprises. They put the role in Faustrel to continue Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan's <laughs> joke. Um, and I think his provocation has really been answered for artists to kind of pick up pataphysics as a way to create and see creation as a way of productive critique, um, which is I think further supported by calling it a musical score. Um, it really suggests that pataphysics is meant from its inception to be more of a verb than a noun an orientation and approach rather than a mode or any particular style. So uh, just to, to wrap things up, I think if part of pataphysics enterprise is to use imagination to create new realities, then it's no surprise that real life imitated literature in this case, case with pataphysics continuing after Jari's death, even as the text of Faustrel uh, famously continues after Faustrel's death in the, in the text. Um, so I'll leave it there for Michael to kind of share a little bit more about one specific avenue that pataphysics took in the yeah, decade. Thank, thank you, Katie. That was a great summary of the book. Um, I mean, I think what's very clear, so first of all, the, the book contains Katie's wonderful introduction, which you've heard excerpts from, and then there are 17 essays, and pataphysics has fueled the imagination of artists, writers, and a diverse range of disciplines. You know, we've got essays on um, architecture, on literature, on, on modern art, uh, on computing. There's almost no field that it hasn't touched, and but we had a, a word limit we had to keep within. So there's 17 essays for you to enjoy, and we see it like a reader. This is something that you want someone who's very curious to know more about pataphysics to reach for this book. Um, so we're very proud of it. Uh, it's wonderful to be on this panel with friends and colleagues like Elliot and Abigail and, and Jonathan, and obviously Katie, you know, who's been such a great partner in this, and, and Mark, whose work I've enjoyed and admired for so long. 
So I'm going to keep it very brief. I just wanted to point out that behind Katie is a work called The Pataphysics Times. And it was made by an artist called Jim Bruton, working in Philadelphia in the 1960s, protesting the Vietnam War and taking the um, anti-rationalism, anti-authoritarianism of uh, pataphysics and applying it to his own work. He, he also thought that pataphysics kind of freed his art. And I think that's really the liberating fact of, of almost everyone that, that's, that's been a subject of this book is how pat pataphysics can really free them up to, to wild experimentation and to take the limits of the possible and, and bring them to their imagination. So with that, I'm gonna stop because I think it's time for us to get to the Q&A, but just thrilled to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, these terrific summaries of these books. And again, I mean, this is just a teaser for the content of the books themselves. Um, I like this idea that this discussion is a kind of supplement to three books that you can pay 40% less for, and yet you're getting more of the book by being here. So I think that's a great, sorry, a great economic, uh, pseudo-economic bargain. Um, anyway, so we have time for Q&A. Uh, I would invite um, anybody in the audience to type a question into the Q&A and we'll get to those questions. I'd like to take this opportunity first uh, to do something that is often not possible with the completed, you know, the authors of completed books, which is to actually engage in discussion with one another. And with that in mind, and as we're waiting for questions from our visitors today, um, I kind of have a, a two pronged question or a question with two parts, really just two questions rolled into one, um, which the first part of that has to do with the umbrella title that we're given today uh, under which to, to, to speak. And I think it really warrants reflection to consider how the really transnational heterogeneous and you know many in many ways quite humorous um set, set of workings constitutes a way to think about radicalism that is uh, interesting and important um so part of my question therefore is to to ask about the ways in which the term radicalism inflects the work represented in these books um, and especially in the political and aesthetic maneuvers of the very heterogeneous movements themselves. Um, and the second part of that is not just to, you know, make extract a definition of radicalism from you, but to also talk about along the way, I'd love to hear about some of the surprises that have emerged from, from this work. Um, I mean, I know that the, the, the level of expertise in this virtual room is extraordinarily high. Um, but I do get the sense that in, in plumbing the, these archives um, of groups that are not right homogenous, but rather, um, and especially in the case of, of, of Marx's work, really, I mean, uh, you know, refusing configuration as such, but really open-ended um, um, configurations of, of work. I'd love to see, about, you know, what are some of the, in tracing the contours of this heterogeneity, um, what are some of the surprises that you encountered as you went, went through it, whether in forms of political expression or in archival and material forms? So um, maybe we can go reprise the order of the um, presentations in speaking about that so that Mark can have a chance to refresh his lungs. And once again, I think you have to unmute. Got it. Um, first of all, uh, I'm ready to go and buy my colleagues' books. <laughs> they all sound fantastic. And, you know, I really see some profound uh, resonance in between what we're all doing together as a collective and exploring issues of avant-gardism and, and the radical. And one of the things that strikes me, um, in the introduction of my book, it's called Anarchism uh, Then and Now, because I wanted to show the fact that anarchism is still relevant in our contemporary culture. And I think that Elliot and Abigail, um, in your anthology, you do that very much in a, in a foregrounded way. 
And Katie and Michael, in turn, I mean, taking on pataphysics, it's, it's maybe one of the generative moments of avant-gardism and anarchism, you know, in terms of Jari and where he was coming from and how he was initially received. And of course, we can think forward um, to Marcel Duchamp as sort of one of the generative characters when it came to pataphysics and its popularization. And he himself was heavily influenced by Max Stirner, a key figure in the anarchist movement. So in many ways, um, what I see that we all share um, is a conception of what Saul Newman, who's a contemporary theorist of anarchism, would call insurrectional politics, uh, an insurrectional form of politics that uh, specifically relates to the notion of the transformation of the individual, of your being as a fundamental way of a fundamental political act. So anarchism and you know, revolutionary thought is not about overthrowing a government so much as transforming yourself first and foremost. And that's the way in which you can initiate the notion of, of an insurrection as opposed to a revolution, um, something in the here and now. And so I see very much surrealism and pataphysics as united in a project like that. And, you know, makes sense that Andre Breton after World War II, in fact, embraced anarchism, actually he did with Trotsky in 1938 as well. So he was looking uh, at that as an alternative source of politics to communism. So that was really fundamental to his rubric. Um, the other thing I want to chat about, or I hope we can talk about is this notion of affinity, which you mentioned. It also figures very prominently in my work as well, where I'm looking at the notion of collectives and how they're formed and how it relates to the anarchist idea of affinity and how that was um, transformed in the hands of ideologues as well as artists in the period before World War I. So uh, affinity is a very important notion and in fact, one can see competing notions or conceptions of affinity within the anarchist movement, which is a fascinating subject as well. Um, another thing that strikes me that I think unites the projects in an interesting way is, how do we think of affinity in light of the notion of humor? How does humor function as a way of creating uh, solidarity, as it were? Um, and how does humor function politically? You know, satire, other sorts of things. So the pataphysical universe is full of satire when it comes to the state, education, you know, all the things by which we are formed as human beings and arguably from an anarchist perspective regulated. And, you know, satire is also fundamental to surrealism. Um, you know, some of the images you showed were very much cutting edge uh, satire and, and, and comical takes on hard realities and social situations. So, you know, I, I, I'd love to open up discussion in that way so that we could talk about all this, this stuff. Maybe I'll mute and let others uh, talk. Yeah, perhaps, again, we can just do this in order because we're running a little bit low on time and we have one question from, uh, two questions now in the, in the Q&A. So perhaps Abigail and Elliot would like to follow that and we can, and we can segue into Katie and Michael about this. Again, there's so much rich material here, so I'll just mute myself as well. I'll speak very briefly, Elliot, and then you could say something. Um, Mark, thank you for that wonderful answer. Um, and so many things you said resonated with me and, and with our project. Um, and, you know, the kind of classic quote from Breton is from a 1935 speech where he talks about, you know, transform the world from Karl Marx, change life from Arthur Rimbaud. Uh, Breton says those are our two watchwords to transform the world, change life. And that's actually at the moment in which the Surrealists are leaving the Communist Party. That's actually the last speech that Breton would have made if he had been given the chance to the, essentially to the French Communist Party. 
Um, but what that opens up is this question that um, the radical is not just a political orientation or maybe uh, a praxis of protest, but is something that would happen on, on the microcosm of the self, right? And that was very much a surrealist idea. If you change the start to change the self, then feasibly we could have a, a collective change in society. And um, if you follow that in a methodological historical sense, then you have a very huge petri dish of mutualism or connectivity um, within terms of studying something like surrealism or radical histories. Um, so that that those connections are possible across disciplines and histories. Yeah, I would love to have those uh, those conversations, Mark, that you brought up of thinking of all of the different connections that surrealism and anarchism, or anarchism have together and um, and really how all of these fit together so nicely. It's a great series because uh, hearing about the pataphysics piece behind Katie there is being an anti-Vietnam piece from the 1960s, like, well, that would have been just perfectly fit in <laughs> to the story of, uh, of how these currents explode out into, uh, into other unexpected avenues. Um, in terms of uh, Jonathan's uh, initial question about radicalism, the something that only I think Abigail probably knows, and it, maybe it's not a good thing to bring up, but still, is that the title Radical Dreams for us actually came to me in a dream. And, uh, and it's a dream that I had very early on in this whole process. And it's one of the reasons that I really wanted to keep that title Radical Dreams, is I felt like if you have a surrealist book, it's good to use the title that came to you in a dream. But this process of thinking about the book has really made me think about how surrealism could be radical, how it is radical, and what radicality might really suggest. Because to be radical is, is very subjective. It, it, it suggests that there's a status quo that's being maintained and somebody else's ideas are radical compared to that. And uh, so the surrealists, you know, maybe had radical ideas compared to a certain status quo, but of course that's what surrealism is about, is not maintaining that status quo of, of fighting um, vehemently against that. So um, perhaps you know, the idea of calling it radical dreams is, uh, is very forward thinking in the sense that later on these dreams wouldn't be so radical if situations changed and context changed. But uh, it has brought up some different perspectives for me. And again, listening to everyone's talks here have made me think about how those dreams would be moving forward in time as well. And just in, thank you, Elliot and Abigail, just in passing, um, the speaking stick to Katie and, and and Michael. I'll just say that one of the other things I love about that title is that it how much it chimes with um, Robin D. G. Kelly's Freedom Dreams, which is a really important. Uh, you know, it has this amazing chapter on the significance of surrealism for him as a historian as well as part of the Chicago Surrealist Group. So as an aside, but I didn't know that quite that that surprise aspect. Um, Katie and Michael, and then I'm like, I'll promise we'll get to the three questions before we conclude. Michael, I'm happy to let you take it. Sure, I'll keep it very brief because I, I was reading those questions in the chat. They're excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think going back to what Mark was saying, I think there's a great synergy between all three books. Um, and maybe it's, it's showing us something about the field. Um, I mean, I think what we certainly found in, in, in our book on pataphysics was pataphysics kind of resists definition and, and it, there is no stable meaning. And I think that's very important to understand when you're putting together a book like this, you kind of don't want it to become the definitive account. And I think there's something that going on where, you know, I was thinking about Radical Dreams and, and that, that exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum that's now at the Tate, which is really an exhibition that was almost impossible to imagine 20 years ago in that it so thoroughly cracks open the canon and expands it. But why not? Why has it taken that long? And I, so I think there is this synergy going on. Um, and I, I think we're like-minded and I think we're asking new questions. But with that, talking of questions, I think we should move on in the interest of time, Jonathan. <laughs> Let's do that. Well, thank you for that brevity and that segue. So uh, if the authors are capable of, I, I, I don't sure if the authors are capable of, of, of um, iterating their own questions because it's a, it's a, it's a webinar. Um, so is it, should, I should read the questions out loud. Um, 
I believe, and uh, I will put together, there are uh, two right away for, for Mark. And so um, one is from, from Theodore Harris, who writes, um, Mr. Your intro, so can you please tell me how the idea of your book came about? And also, do you know the work of art historian David Craven? And perhaps in addressing that, you could also address um, Lee Sorensen's question about, is there, any, is there anything about the extreme physical nature of sculpture that appealed or to or further the anti-state stance of these artists' work, thinking in particular of the Wild Monument at Carrages. So, um, David Craven, sadly, is no longer with us. Um, he's a fantastic scholar, and he wrote a brilliant book on abstract expressionism, which was looking at the a political group around a journal called Descent. And um, he was 50s period, I think, if I remember correctly. And he's worked on Meyer Shapiro. And so he was interested in dissident socialism and particularly, which I found brilliant, you know, in his work was his notion of taking abstract expressionism, which had been characterized as a sort of weapon of the Cold War by the United States, if you look at Serge Gobo and some others who'd written on that, and talking about how um, abstract expressionism was received in Central and South America and the way in which um, that movement could be seen as politically uh, liberating, liberatory, and, and, and received as such in a very important way. Um, you know, again, it reminds me of the way in which surrealism has migrated around the world, um, just like abstract expressionism had been politicized in ways that are wonderful and Breton probably would have loved. But similarly, you know, if you look at the abstract expressionists, Barnett Newman, upfront anarchist. Um, so there's a way in which uh, that work has resonated with movements uh, for political agitation outside of the frame of, of North America or Europe. And so that's, that's a very fundamental thing. Jonathan, could you remind me of the first half of the question? Uh, the first half of the question had to do, well, uh, of that question had to do, but just the idea of the book. Oh, yes. Um, right. Just, where it came from. About that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's really interesting. Uh, the first thing I ever wrote in my life was on Godier Breshka. When I was a graduate student at Yale, I had the pleasure of doing a small exhibition of his drawings at the British Art Center. And so as an artist, he'd stuck with me. You know, uh, he was somebody who was very important in my imagination. And in terms of the book's generative moment, I would say it had to do with a collaboration I had with Vivian Green uh, when um, Vivian and I, she's a curator at the uh, Guggenheim, we collaborated on an exhibition of vorticism, uh, which created the vortices three generative exhibitions um, during World War I. And we put that, that show together and it was a gener it emerged at, at the Nasher, at Duke um, Nasher Museum of Art in 2010. They went to the Peggy Guggenheim and Tate Britain in 2011. And in working on that exhibition, I began to think about sculpture because it's pretty much, it's one of those media that is a tough one to deal with and it's somewhat neglected in the history of art. We tend to focus on painting. And I saw it as particularly challenging as a medium um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one being, I think, most fundamentally, the whole process of creating sculpture and the variety of ways in which sculpture was created. So I was really interested in, in why it is that many of the artists I was looking at, particularly Epstein and, and Godier, were interested in direct carving. And I began to think of that in terms of direct action, knowing that both of them were engaged in anarchism as an ideology. So that got me to start to think about, you know, how anarchism could relate to sculpture. Nobody had asked that question. And so I decided to, to take that on as my project. Um, that was a fundamental thing for me. Uh, for Lee's question, uh, you know, in terms of the physicality of sculpture, um, 
something that is very important. Of course, this is true for all of us. Um, one has to see the work to understand it. And this is particularly true with regard to my notion of the politicized uh, nature of sculpture. Um, you look at a work by Godier Breska, for instance, many of the works he created when he was most closely tied to Ezra Pound and the egoist anarchist movement were handheld sculptures. And so I thought about the issue of handheld sculpture. The fact that it's not an object that's on a pedestal, that's at a psychological distance from you. In fact, it's an extension of your own embodiment. It's something you pick up, you handle, you burnish. It changes over time on how, how you carry it around. T.E. Holm, uh, for whom uh, Godier made a number of these things, he had them in his pocket. He used to fondle them during conversations. They were carved as totems uh, and, and charms that, that Godier created for his inner circle. And in that sense, they were part and parcel of the kind of uh, anarchist notion of affinity of which he's all about. Um, that is a way of creating a social bond between individuals, um, a way in which the sculpture itself is physically melded to the individual through their handling of the work. Uh, you know, it became part of a way of life, again, it's a fundamental thing. So those are the ways in which, um, you know, why sculpture fascinates me and uh, led me to work on this book. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And I'm aware that we're over time, so I'd like to make two proposals, one very modest and one a little less modest. The, the very modest one is I want to read um, John Hiana's three questions that are all kind of interrelating these uh, works. And I feel like that iterating the question will go far to set up my second modest proposal, which is that I know that John Hian and, um, and Theodore Harris, and as well as uh, Katie and Michael are kind of affiliated with uh, the Philadelphia-based Philadelphia um, Avant-Garde Studies Consortium. And in perhaps there's some way that in tandem with the ISSS, there might be a way to have a con further conversation about, about these works in, in their, their own affinities with each other. So um, that's my sort of less modest proposal, but I'm really hoping we can take that up. So um, again, I hate to do this in a validatory fashion. I'm gonna read these questions and then <laughs> remind everybody about the discount code. So uh, again, I'm aware that we're over time already. So. Uh, we have three questions from John Hian. Uh, one is for Abigail and Elliot, um, and is, it's wondering if you saw pataphysics popping up in your research on surrealism in the 60s and 70s, and if so, which, which figures referred to it or employed it and how? And, and this is bringing this up in, um, because of Jarry's importance for early data and surrealism. So that's a question that I feel you know, has already come up in some of the, in some of the conversation. Um, John also has a question from Mark, but I think it also proceeds um, from Katie's and, and Michael's work too, which is um, kind of moving the, the dropper into the other Alembic here. What do you see as the function of surrealist humor uh, for contemporary mo uh, modern science? Um, in especially in its commentary on modern science and scientists and society's attitude towards science, technology, and I would add scientism as well. So we're thinking about, I think there's so much richness between in the dialogues, not only within these three books, but also between them, uh, particularly with the, the idea of modern science in there. Um, I hate to prevent there from being further conversation at this point, but I don't want to abuse um, my colleagues at the press by uh, extending this too much beyond five o'clock, which we already are. So in closing, therefore, I'd like to thank once again, um, Kate Frick, the press, Ellie Goodman, uh, for making this all possible. I'd really like to thank um, our, our panelists and as well as our attendees. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're talking about your work. Thank you for tuning in. And again, attendees will re receive a follow-up email with links to all the books, as well as a special discount code for 40% off. Please follow Penn State Press on Twitter and Facebook, and um, you can look up other book titles uh, in the series. And again, I hope we can continue this conversation in additional form. So thank you so much for your excellent words. 
in print as well as uh, over the internet here. It's a real pleasure. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.